welcome to the Lazy Book Club podcast, the book club for those who don't want to read or leave the house. My name is Matt Gonzalez. My name is David Cox. And my name is Josh Matheson. And this week we are looking at chapter five of Peter Pan, which if I remember correctly is The Island Come True. Come True, yeah. Which is a bit of a vague title, Barry not giving anything away as to what's going to happen in the next stint of this adventure. But let's just recap where we left off last week. So the kids have finally arrived at Neverland. Yeah, and it seems to be it seemed to be like an amalgamation of the Neverlands that had been described earlier. Like it wasn't just Wendy's one or just John's or Michael's. It was like a mixture. Yeah, they've all been everyone. smashed together. Yeah. And okay. uh, it was like a nice introduction to maybe what's going to come ahead. So you're seeing little glimpses of people we might we might meet in that. So it's yes. quite a nice sort of like, a, oh, that's going to come later. So yeah. I quite liked it. Neverland kind of had a bit of a violent welcome for the kids because the pirates started shooting Long John at them, which has caused oh, yeah. them to scatter. We've now got two groups, I believe. We've got Peter Pan was blown out towards the sea and then Wendy and Tinkerbell have ended up in their own group because Wendy was carrying Tinkerbell in a hat. And Tinkerbell has now decided that she's going to get rid of the only girl in the group by leading Wendy to her doom. So we haven't found out what Tink's plan is yet, but... She's a right mischievous little son. So she is, she? definitely. Oh, she know. does not like Wendy at all. She's got some sass. Yes. Now, now I met, I've met some very sassy fairies of my <laughs> travels, but she is <laughs> right at the top of the bunch. So. <laughs> so should we find out what Tinkerbell's big plan is then? Yes. Here we go. Yes, let's. Chapter five, The Island Come True. Feeling that Peter was on his way back, the Neverland had again woke into life. We ought to use the plu perfect and say wakened, but woke is better and was always used by Peter. <laughs> Neverland is woke, bruv. <laughs> I should use this type of grammar, but I'm going to do my own thing. But I'm Peter. I ain't grown up. I've just I've <laughs> never known uh, an author to like describe the tenses being used before. Yeah, but I also I love that the modern equivalent of being woke. Yeah, is also grammatically incorrect. Do you know what I mean? When yeah. someone says, "Yeah, I'm woke," it's like, "Well, no, you should say I'm awake." Technically, yeah. but <laughs> no, no, you're awake, and I think you're fine. You're yeah. being woke against the woke. It's exactly. like, <laughs> in his absence, things are usually quiet on the island. The fairies take an hour longer in the morning. The beasts attend to their young. The redskins feed heavily for six days and nights. And when pirates and lost boys meet, they merely bite their thumbs at each other. But with the coming of Peter, who hates lethargy, they are underway again. If you put your ear to the ground now, you would hear the whole island seething with life. On this evening, the chief forces of the island were disposed as follows. The lost boys were out looking for Peter. The pirates were out looking for the lost boys the Redskins were out looking for the pirates, and the Beasts were out looking for the Redskins. It's like a, <laughs> it's like a game of... Uh, Follow the like, leader, like a, just this circle yeah. of people just walking around the island <laughs> in, on each other's trails. They were all going round and round the island, but they did not meet because all were going at the same rate. <laughs> <Brilliant. laughs> just like uh. <laughs> so not, not one bright spark's gone should we just stay still for a bit or no, just can't go yeah, hide yeah. in a bush and then see if anyone comes it's just musical like, chairs uh, around an island literally all wanted blood except the boys who liked it as a rule but tonight were out to greet their captain the boys on the island vary of course in numbers according as they get killed and so on and when they seem to be growing up, which is against the rules, Peter thins them out. But at this time, there were six of them, counting the twins as two. Well, you wouldn't count the twins as one, would you? <laughs> <laughs> also, it seems to be suggesting that Peter just, like, culls any of his, any, any of his crew whenever they get a bit old. Yeah. Yeah, but there, there is a theory. When my friend um, Harry, who actually listens to this podcast, said that there is a theory that Peter Pan takes the lost boy away when they get too old and kills them wow like a proper gangster isn't he yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's, a, he's a he's a dom he's yeah. a godfather <laughs> but peter only <laughs> <laughs> the lost boys are getting too old <laughs> <laughs> 
Have we made a mistake then with our accent choice here? Oh, well, no, I don't know. You can make the Lost Boys all Italian gangsters. <laughs> <laughs> yes! That's such a good idea. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Let us pretend to lie here among the sugarcane and watch them as they steal by in single file, each with his hand on his dagger. They are forbidden by Peter to look in the least like him, and they wear the skins of the bears slain by themselves, in which they are so round and furry that when they fall, they roll. (laughs) The first to pass is Tootles. Not the least brave, but the most unfortunate of all that gallant band. He had been in fewer adventures than any of them, because the big things constantly happened just when he had stepped around the corner. All would be quiet. He would take the opportunity of going off to gather a few sticks for firewood. And then when he returned, the others would be sweeping up the blood. (laughs) So he just got FOMO. (laughs) <laughs> Every single time he's like, no oh, one do again. anything. I'm just stepping away. <laughs> and then he comes back and it's just like, oh, mate, you missed it. Pirates, aliens, treasure, again. mermaids. Again. <laughs> we had pizza. <laughs> pizza. <laughs> pizza pan. Oh, you missed karaoke night. Yeah, is that- <laughs> this ill luck had given a gentle melancholy to his countenance, but instead of souring his nature, had sweetened it so that he was quite the humblest of the boys. Poor, kind Tootles, there is danger in the air for you tonight. Take care lest an adventure is now offered you, which, if accepted, will plunge you in deepest woe. Tootles, the fairy Tink, who is bent on mischief this night, is looking for a tool for doing her mischief, and she thinks you are the most easily tricked of the boys. Where Tinkerbell. Now that's where with an apostrophe before it, as in beware, I think. Would that he could hear us, but we are not really on the island, and he passes by, biting his knuckles. Next comes Nibs, the gay and debonair, followed by Slightly. <laughs> are you laughing at yeah, gay and debonair? I like Nibs. <laughs> <laughs> For goodness sake. Can we make Nibs c- camp as Christmas? Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Followed by Slightly, who cuts whistles out of the trees and dances ecstatically to his own tunes. Slightly is the most conceited of the boys. He thinks he remembers the days before he was lost, with their manners and customs, and this has given his nose an offensive tilt. Curly is fourth. He is a pickle. A person who gets in pickle predicaments. <laughs> I thought you were, he's literally a pickle. Rick he's a pickle. <laughs> yeah. Pickle Rick. Yeah. Either that or Peter Pan's just really upset that he hasn't got enough people. So he's just dressing up vegetables as friends and just pretending <laughs> that they're people. <laughs> Number five was courgette. Yeah. I do quite like the, I do quite like the phrase of calling somebody a pickle as in yeah. somebody who gets in a lot of pickles. Yeah. And so often has he had to deliver up his person when Peter said sternly, Stand forth, the one who did this thing, that now at the command he stands forth automatically, whether he's done it or not. <laughs> Last come the twins, who cannot be described because we should be sure to be describing the wrong one. <laughs> so that I, I, I'm trying to get my head around that. So he's basically going, I can't tell them apart, so I can't be bothered to even try and describe them. Peter never quite knew what twins were, and his band were not allowed to know anything he didn't know. So these two were always vague about themselves, and did their best to give satisfaction by keeping close together in an apologetic sort of way. So they just the pretend bo- to be one person. Yeah, that's like, why they were saying it's six, including the <gasps> twins, because they're we're basically to be here. they basically sit with their heads pressed up against each other, so they can pretend to be one <laughs> guy. <laughs> the boys vanish in the gloom, and after a pause, but not a long pause, for things go briskly on the island, come the pirates on their track. We hear them before they are seen, and it is always the same dreadful song. So in this we... whole chapter, wait, we're going to go into a song, which is amazing. We're about to go but into a song. What's the, so is this chapter just going to be him just going around the island, just introducing everybody? Uh, Maybe. It seems to be. I don't mind that. I really don't mind that. No, but it's just, 
Like normally with an author, you get an introduction to someone as they enter the story and they do something significant. You don't just go around going, oh, by the way, these are all the people you are going to encounter at some point during the story. And I'm just going to introduce them all now. You know? Yeah, it's true, actually. Uh, so uh, I've got to sing this song. It's not very long. It's a pirate song, isn't it? It is. This is the pirate's dreadful song, yeah. So do you have to sing it to something like what would we do with a drunken sailor or like some kind of sea shanty? Well, we, I think we're going to have, have more songs, aren't we? Probably. I, I'm, I, guess I don't know. I'm hoping Thanks, Nib really. has a song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only real fairy. <laughs> is the title of his song. <laughs> well, he wants to be a fairy. He wants to be he a fairy. Be, why, oh, why can't I be a fairy? <laughs> like, we, like, he has an interaction with Tinkerbell. Tinkerbell exit, exits, and then it's like that sort of soliloquy. Yeah, the monologue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How fast, belay, oh ho, heave to a pirate and we go. And if we're parted by a shot, we're sure to meet below. There you go. It's just a, just a short one, just a wet your whistle. There you it's go. nice. Though. I, I love how you just come up with these melodies, though. They're always great. There's, def- no there's definitely a side thing. The songs of the Lazy Book Club. Yes, yeah. exactly. There's an album coming. Here, a little in advance, ever and again with his head to the ground listening, his great arms bare, pieces of eight in his ears as ornaments, is the handsome Italian, Checho, who cut his name <laughs> in letters of blood on the back of the governor of the prison of Geo. That gigantic black behind him has had many names since he dropped the one with which dusky mothers still terrify their children on the banks of the Guajamo. Here is Bill Jukes. Every Sorry, inch of can him we just tattooed. go back a second? So yeah. just, just to point this out, yeah. that last guy you described, yeah. his name is Black Pirate. So I'm guess, guessing he's a black guy who's a pirate. Wait, hang on. Who? who? Which character? The one you just described with the Gajamo. That gigantic black behind. Oh, right, yeah. Oh, he's it's the very, to... very un-PC way that he's just described the black guy behind the Italian guy. <laughs> oh, oh. Didn't, even say, didn't even say black person. No, that's what I'm oh, saying. Geez. It's so un-PC. It's so bad. We're thrust back into the 19th century with a plum. Here is Bill Jukes, every inch of him tattooed. The same Bill Jukes who got six dozen on the walrus from Flint before he would drop the bag of Moidors, Portuguese gold pieces. And Cookson, said to be Black Murphy's brother, but this was never proved. And Gentleman Starkey, once an usher in a public school and still dainty in his ways of killing. And Skylights, Morgan Skylights, and the Irish boatswain Smee, an oddly genial man who stabbed, so to speak, without offence and was the only non-conformist in Hook's crew. And Nodler, whose hands were fixed on backwards, and Robert Mullins and Alf Mason and many other ruffians long known and feared on the Spanish main. In the midst of them, the blackest and largest in that dark setting, reclined James Hook, or, as he wrote himself, J.A.S. Hook, of whom it is said he was the only man that the sea cook feared. He lay at his ease in a rough chariot drawn and propelled by his men, and instead of a right hand, he had the iron hook with which ever and anon he encouraged them to increase their pace, as dogs this terrible man treated and addressed them, and as dogs they obeyed him. In person he was cadaverous, dead-looking, and black-avised, dark-faced, and his hair was dressed in long curls, which, at the little distance, looked like black candles and gave a singularly threatening expression to his handsome countenance. Like dread- so, it pretty mu- so it pretty much does say he's black with dreads. Wow. Does that mean we're going to make him with a Jamaican accent then? I, th- I think it would work. It would you'd give him a Pirates of the Caribbean feel to him, wouldn't but it? It, it'd be makes, great. it, it really makes would. A complete, it makes complete sense. Yeah. The Caribbean and no, Hispaniola and all that sort of thing. Classic white privilege Disney. We've all been we've led to believe that Captain yeah. Hook is this white fella. Yeah. yeah. His eyes were of the blue of the forget-me-not and of a profound melancholy, save when he was plunging his hook into you. 
at which time two red spots appeared in them and lit them up horribly. In manner, something of the grand seigneur still clung to him, so that he even ripped you up with an air. And I have been told that he was a raconteur, storyteller, of repute. He was never more sinister than when he was most polite, which is probably the truest test of breeding. And the elegance of his diction, even when he was swearing, no less than the distinction of his demeanour, showed him one of a different caste from his crew. That's so interesting, is it? Because so many things in this period, whenever they do like dramas, like BBC dramas and other things and films, is that often when people of society are being their most cutting is when they are being their most polite. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's always in court and it's always in the drawing room where these remarks are made and they're just like said so politely, but they just, it's like a slap around the face, isn't it? Yeah. So it's just kind of quite cool how Barry's like alluding to that. That like, well, and um, in in, um, in in Hollywood they like to romanticise, and it's why you'll often get the Brit. I was just going to uh, say often exactly RP the same cast thing. As 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 the uh, as the baddie, because yeah. it sounds like oh, he's really posh and really articulate. He must have gone to Cambridge, and therefore he must has be evil. No- <laughs> well, because they they, us- <laughs> they usually have to be clever. They're not like they're not like oh god, this is the guy in his laboratory. Well, I'm gonna get you. <laughs> you're a man now <laughs> the only time that that southern accent doesn't work is wild wild west where That's the true. baddie was an inventor and he had one of those southern draws and in toy story 2 the prospector oh it's true yes he was very conniving but if you imagine sideshow bob is the best is the, probably the best RP, yes kelsey grammar yes and it works so well, and he's really polite, and he sings like Gilbert and Sullivan, and he's yeah. camp as Christmas, but it's yeah. still really scary. It's great. Oh, he is terrifying. Yeah, but Kelsey Grammer is also the voice of the prospector. Uh, Are you kidding? Uh, no. Ah, we, I made a little link there. You did? He has range. <laughs> he's got range. <laughs> well, not really. He's playing the baddie in both of them. <laughs> <laughs> he had a school named after him, though. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Kelsey grab us. <laughs> <laughs> I've got water in my mouth and I'm trying not to spit it all over the computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, David, you're such an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> A man of indomitable courage. It was said that the only thing he shied at was the sight of his own blood, which was thick and of an unusual colour. In dress, he somewhat aped the attire associated with the name of Charles II, having heard it said in some earlier period of his career that he bore a strange resemblance to the ill-fated Stuarts, and in his mouth he had a holder of his own contrivance, which enabled him to smoke two cigars at once. But (laughs) undoubtedly, the grimmest part of him was his iron claw. So this is interesting. So that is this kind of where... Pirates dressed as sort of stewards, you know, with the curly wig and the mm. and the thing and the and the high heels. Is that where that sort of came from? Yeah, I think that's yeah. what they're trying to describe that he bears a resemblance to what was it, King Charles II. Charles II, so that- yeah, yeah, yeah. Could I just say he's very lucky that his surname was Hook. It's true. <laughs> I mean, because there's no mention that he changed it to Hook after he got the hook. <laughs> Do you think he just picked whatever his surname was and then oh I'll just stick whatever my surname is on my hand instead? Yeah. Good job his last name's not Sponge. <laughs> Good job his surname's not Cox. <laughs> <laughs> James Cox. Oh, bollocks. <laughs> that would make the fight scenes a lot more interesting. <laughs> Let us now kill a pirate to show Hook's method. Skylights will do. As they pass, Skylights lurches clumsily against him, ruffling his lace collar. The Hook shoots forth, there is a tearing sound and one screech, and then the body is kicked aside and the pirates pass on. He has not even taken the cigars from his mouth. Such is the terrible man against whom Peter Pan is pitted. Which will win? That was like a trailer, wasn't it? 
Which will win? <laughs> Who's going to win? I so that's really badass, though. He's literally like, he's still got his cigar, two cigars. Two he's cigars. He's gone past, just some guy's just thwarted out the way. And he's not Such... even like broken breath and not, but hasn't broken his canter or his walk. He's badass. That's, yeah. On the trail of the pirates, stealing noiselessly down the warpath, which is not visible to inexperienced eyes, come the redskins, every one of them with his eyes peeled. They carry tomahawks and knives, and their naked bodies gleam with paint and oil. Strung around them are scalps, of boys as well as pirates, and these are the Piccaninny tribe, and not to be confused with the softer-hearted Delawares or the Hurons. Did Boris Johnson write this book? (laughs) <laughs> As we say, we'd like to apologise for the uh, any terms that are insensitive or not appropriate nowadays. Obviously, this is an historical book, and these words do not reflect our own viewpoints or our own attitude. Disclaimer. <laughs> so please do not hold them. Yeah, please do not hold them against us. Yeah, we'll blame Barry. In the van, on all fours, is Great Big Little Panther, a brave of so many scalps that in his present position... They somewhat impede his progress. Bringing up the rear, the place of greatest danger, comes Tiger Lily, proudly erect, a princess in her own right. She is the most beautiful of the dusky Dianas. Diana is a goddess of the woods. And the belle of the Piccaninnies, coquettish, flirting, cold and amorous, loving, by turns. There is not a brave who would not have the wayward thing to wife but she staves off the altar with a hatchet. Observe how they pass over fallen twigs without making the slightest noise. The only sound to be heard is their somewhat heavy breathing. The fact is that they are all a little fat just now, after the heavy gorging, and in time they will work this off. For the moment, however, it constitutes their chief danger. Soon their place is taken by the beasts, a great and motley procession. Lions, tigers, bears. Oh, my! <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, it was like, oh, I would <laughs> I could not say that. That's, yeah. You know. <laughs> Do you think this is the first reference of that? Or is that, does that Who thing knows? happen before this? Lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my! Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe he invented it. Is lions and tigers and bears in Wizard of Oz? Yeah. It's a line from Wizard of Oz. Well, this is def- this definitely precedes the Wizard of Oz. So, but yeah, they, they, that's from the uh, it's from the movie Lions and Tigers and Bears. Oh my, not just Lions and Tigers, but it's from the 1939 movie The Wizard of Oz. It is never said in the book on which it is based. Lions, tigers, bears, and the innumerable smaller savage things that flee from them. For every kind of beast, and more particularly, all the man eaters live cheek by jowl on the favoured island. Their tongues are hanging out. They are hungry tonight. When they have passed, comes the last figure of them all, a gigantic crocodile. We shall see for whom she is looking presently. The crocodile passes, but soon the boys appear again, for the procession must continue indefinitely until one of the parties stops or changes its pace. Then, quickly, they will be on top of each other. All are keeping a sharp lookout in front, but none suspects that the danger may be creeping up from behind. This shows how real the island was. The first to fall out of the moving circle was the boys. They flung themselves down on the sword. Sword with an A, which apparently means the turf. They flung themselves down on the sword, close to their underground home. And then one of them speaks, but he doesn't say which one. What is their collective voice, please? A 1920s gangster with a Tommy gun in a violin case. Bugsy Malone it. Yeah. Okay. So it might be over the top. Go <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll over the top it, Bugsy Malone style. And make them like proper little boys as well. It can't be broken voices. They have to okay. be like, yeah. I do wish Peter would come back. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Every one of them said nervously, though in height and still more in breadth, they were all larger than their captain. I am the only one who's not afraid of the pirates, slightly said, in the tone that prevented his being a general favourite, but perhaps some distant sound disturbed him. 
for he added hastily, but I wish he would come back and tell us whether he has heard any more about Cinderella. They talked of Cinderella, and Tootles was confident that his mother must have been very like her. It was only in Peter's absence that they could speak of mothers, the subject being forbidden by him as silly. And here's where Nib says something. So if I just got to go really, really camp. Yeah. But, but still as a, as a gangster. <laughs> I don't think we can offend any more people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we might as well just get everyone involved. Well, I remember about my mother, Nibs told them, <laughs> is that she often said to my father, oh, how I wish I had a checkbook of my own. I don't know what a checkbook is, but I should just love to give my mother one. <laughs> While they talked, they heard a distant sound. You or I, not being wild things of the woods, would have heard nothing. But they heard it, and it was a grim song. Yo-ho, yo-ho, the pirate life, the flag of skull and bones. A merry hour, a hemp and rope, and hey for Davy Jones. Ah. At once, the lost boys. But where are they? They were no longer there. Rabbits could not have disappeared more quickly. I will tell you where they are, with the exception of Nibs, who has darted away to reconnoitre, look around. They are already in their home under the ground, a very delightful residence of which we shall see a good deal presently. But how have they reached it? For there is no entrance to be seen, not so much as a large stone, which, if rolled away, would disclose the mouth of a cave. Look closely, however and you may note that there are seven large trees, each with a hole in its hollow trunk as large as a boy. These are the seven entrances to the home under the ground, for which Hook had been searching in vain these many moons. Will he find it tonight? As the pirates advanced, the quick eye of Starkey sighted Nibs disappearing through the wood, and at once his pistol flashed out, but an iron claw gripped his shoulder. And then uh, Starkey says something. Should the pirates just have like a, a standard kind of Captain Barbosa kind of pirate voice? Well, I feel like Hook and Smee should both be different, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel Smee like any of, the other ca- any of the other pirates can just have like pirate voice. Captain, let go! He cried, rising. Now, for the first time, we hear the voice of Hook. It was a black voice. Oh, it actually what? says it. Black really? Voice. What? That's hilarious. <laughs> Do it in the West Indian and let's hear it. Put back that pistol first, it said threateningly. It was one of those boys you hate. I could have shot him dead. Aye, and the sound would have brought Tiger Lily's red skins upon us. Do you want to lose your scalp? Smeeze now says something. <gasps> pathetic Smeeze described as. <laughs> pathetic. Oh, what pathetic. A pathetic oh. accent. Um, Could it be like Kevin from Kevin and Mary? <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. Patterson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's been a long time since I've watched Kevin and Mary. Not really pathetic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a bit of a chavvy falsetto. Okay, yeah, like, we see Sophie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any any non-British audiences to our podcast? I know, like, they're what? not going to have a clue what we're on about. They're going to have to YouTube so many different British references. We'll have a glossary when we get... I, I even think <laughs> yeah. some of our younger listeners are not going to have a clue. But no. Shall I after him, Captain? <laughs> <laughs> He's like an intern. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A really spotty one. He's on probation. <laughs> Work experience. <laughs> yeah. Year 10. Well, because it's also like the um, those two interns from Monsters, Inc. You know, the two... Oh, can I do it like them? Like yeah, that, uh... yeah, okay, do it like that. <laughs> like, okay, I'll do it again like American, because they're, cause they're good. I love them. Shall I after him, Captain? <laughs> <laughs> Asked pathetic Smee. Maybe not put as many um, voice breaks in it, but yes, I'm uh, liking okay. the American. <laughs> okay. A tickle it with Johnny Corkscrew. 
Smee had pleasant names for everything, and his cutlass was Johnny Corkscrew, because he wiggled it in the wound. Oh. That's horrible. Yeah, that's really <laughs> graphic. One could mention many lovable traits in Smee. For instance, after killing, it was his spectacles he wiped instead of his weapon. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise Smee was so like Hands the on. action. I thought he was like, yeah. you know, like the the assistant and the cook yeah. and things the like PA. that. The PA. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny's a silent fellow. He reminded Hook. Not now, Smee. Hook said darkly. He is only one, and I want to mischief all the seven. Scatter and look for them. The pirates disappeared among the trees, and in a moment their captain and Smee were alone. Hook heaved a heavy sigh, and I know not why it was. Perhaps it was because of the soft beauty of the evening, but there came over him a desire to confide in his faithful boatswain, the story of his life. He spoke long and earnestly, but what it was all about, Smee, who was rather stupid, did not know in the least. Anon, later, he caught the word Peter. Most of all, Hook was saying passionately, I want their captain, Peter Pan. Twas he cut off my arm. He brandished the hook threateningly. I've waited so long to shake his hand with this. or oh, I'll tear him. And, and yet said Smee. <laughs> I have often heard you say that Hook was worth a score of hands for combining his hair and other homely uses. <laughs> Aye, the captain answered. If I was a mother, I would pray to have my children born with this instead of that. And he cast a look of pride upon his iron hand and one of scorn upon the other. You can tell he's the one not doing the pushing by saying, I wish all my kids were born yeah. with one. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. I don't think he's had a girlfriend. Be a really good cloakroom assistant, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> then again, he frowned. Peter flung my arm, he said, wincing, to a crocodile that happened to be passing by. I have often, said Smee, noticed your strange dread of crocodiles. <laughs> Not of crocodiles, Hook corrected him, but of that one crocodile. He lowered his voice. It liked my arm so much, Smee, that it has followed me ever since from sea to sea and from land to land, licking its lips for the rest of me. I just love the idea that this crocodile's just got the munchies for Hook. He's like, once he's had a taste, he cannot get it up. In a way, said Smee, it's sort of a compliment. I want no such compliments, Hook barked petulantly. I want Peter Pan, who first gave the brute its taste for me. He sat down on a large mushroom, and now there was a quiver in his voice. <laughs> Are we back in Alice's Ventures in Wonderland? Yeah, apparently. Like this huge toadstool. Yeah. Smee, he said huskily. That crocodile would have had me before this, but by a lucky chance it swallowed a clock which goes tick, tick inside it. And so before it can reach me, I hear the tick and bolt. He laughed, but in a hollow way. Some day, said Smee, the clock will run down and then he'll get you. <laughs> Cheers, mate. That's what you want to say to your boss. Yeah. Hook wetted his dry lips. Aye, he said. That's the fear that haunts me. Oh, at least Captain Hook can own up to his fears. That's very grown up of him. It is, but more so than uh, Mr. Darling. So no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Since sitting down, he had felt curiously warm. Smee, he said, this seat is hot. He jumped up. Odds, bobs, hammer and tongues, I'm burning. They examined the mushroom, 
which was of a size and solidity unknown to the mainland. They tried to pull it up, and it came away at once in their hands, for it had no root. Stranger still, smoke began at once to ascend. The pirates looked at each other. A chimney! They both exclaimed. Ah, it's a fake mushroom. They had indeed discovered the chimney of the home under the ground. Can I just say, what a great way to disguise. Let's disguise our chimney as something that doesn't exist. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like, let's not disguise it as a boulder or a tree. Let's pick something, make it giant to hide (laughs) the entrance to our hideaway. I mean, it's so (laughs) stupid. (laughs) It was the custom of the boys to stop it with a mushroom when enemies were in the neighbourhood. Not only smoke came out of it, there came also children's voices, for so safe did the boys feel in their hiding place that they were gaily chattering. The pirates listened grimly and then replaced the mushroom. They looked around them and noted the holes in the seven trees. Did you hear them say Peter Pants from home? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to do that voice in a whisper is just brilliant it's like homer simpson's whisper <laughs> <laughs> he's talking to you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> smee whispered fidgeting with johnny corkscrew hook nodded he stood for a long time lost in thought and at last a curdling smile lit up his swarthy face smee had been waiting for it Unrip your plan, Captain, he cried eagerly. To return to the ship, Hook replied slowly through his teeth, and cook a large, rich cake of a jolly thickness with green sugar on it. There can be but one room below, for there is but one chimney. The silly moles had not the sense to see that they did not need a door apiece. That shows they have no mother. We will leave the cake on the shores of the mermaid's lagoon. These boys are always swimming about there, playing with their mermaids. They will find the cake and they will gobble it up. Because having no mother, they know how dangerous it is to eat rich, damp cake. He bursts into laughter. Not hollow laughter now, but honest laughter. (laughs) <laughs> they will die. Smee had listened is this with a poison cake, or is this just um? Why is it? They're it's right uh, there. Green sugar. It says just got green sugar on it. Why don't they just like they found it and they've got them like they're sitting ducks? Why don't they just like raid the the? Why don't they just throw, throw a grenade? Yeah, down the smoke hole? them out. Yeah. Or like just set light to some wood and throw it down there. Does that make any like, sense? Well, let's, we'll leave a cake on the beach and then they'll get poisoned. It's like, yeah, or they might not eat the cake. Yeah. Smee had listened with growing admiration. It's the wickedest, prettiest policy I ever heard of, he cried. And in their exultation, they danced and sang. <laughs> so this is Captain Hook and Bosun Smee singing a duet. <laughs> oh. Oh. I hope I it's a ballad. Can you sing? It's, you another sing? Little, it's another shanty. Avast, Belier, when I appear, by fear they're overtook. Knots left upon your bones when you have shaken claws with hook. It's more like a rap, really, isn't it? Yeah, it was kind of rappy. <laughs> <laughs> they began the verse, but they never finished it, for another sound broke in and stilled them. There was, at first, such a tiny sound that a leaf might have fallen on it and smothered it, but as it came nearer, it was more distinct. Tick, 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 tick. Hook stood shuddering, one foot in the air. The crocodile! He gasped and bounded away, followed by his bosun. It was indeed the crocodile. It had passed the Redskins, who were now on the trail of the other pirates. It oozed on after Hook. Oh, Once I like that. It oozed, oozed on. That's a good yeah. adjective. Particularly for like slinking. Yeah, I like that. Like a wet look. <laughs> BO5. <laughs> Once more, the boys emerged into the open. 
But the dangers of the night were not yet over, for presently Nibs rushed breathless into their midst, pursued by a pack of wolves. The tongues of the pursuers were hanging out. The baying of them was horrible. Shave me, shave me! <laughs> cried Nibs, falling on the ground. <laughs> but what can we do? What can we do? It was a high compliment to Peter that at that dire moment their thoughts turned to him. What would Peter do? They cried simultaneously. Almost in the same breath, they cried, Peter would look at them through his legs. And then, let us do what Peter would do. It is quite the most successful way of defying wolves, and as one boy they bent and looked through their legs. The next moment is the long one, but victory came quickly, for as the boys advanced upon them in the terrible attitude, the wolves dropped their tails and fled. <laughs> so they've just run at the wolves, bum and, first, looking then, at them between their legs, and, and the, the wolves, wolves are like, gone. What? The wolves are gone, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> You're weird. Yeah, that's what, that, that's what they, it's like. We're not going to physically beat them. So let's just be weird to them. I would imagine they're probably also going, oh, 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 oh. That's, what that's what they're doing in my head. And flailing their arms like, like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now Nibs rose from the ground and the others thought that his staring eyes still saw the wolves. But it was not the wolves he saw. I have seen a wonderful thing he cried as they gathered round him eagerly. A great white bird! It is flying this way! What kind of bird do you think? I don't know, <laughs> Nib said, awestruck. But it, but it looks so weary, and as it flies, it moans poor Wendy. Poor Wendy? I remember, said Slightly instantly. There are birds called Wendy's. See, here it comes! cried Curly, pointing to Wendy in the heavens. Wendy was now almost overhead, and they could hear her plaintive cry. But more distinct came the shrill voice of Tinkerbell. The jealous fairy had now cast off all disguise of friendship and was darting at her victim from every direction, pinching savagely each time she touched. Hello, Tink, cried the wandering boys. Tink's reply rang out. To shoot the windy boom, big bird boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she doesn't talk much. <laughs> it was not in their nature to question when Peter ordered. Let us do what Peter wishes, cried the simple boys. Quick, bows and arrows. All but Tootles popped down their trees. He had a bow and arrow with him, and Tink noted it and rubbed her little hands. Quick, Toodles, quick, she screamed. Peter will be so pleased, Dong. <laughs> I feel like that Dong was slightly smeified. Just yeah. like, Dong, Dong. Dong. <laughs> He joined in from afar. Uh, <laughs> Tootles excitedly fitted the arrow to his bow. Out of the way, Tink, he shouted, and then he fired and Wendy fluttered to the ground with an arrow in her breast. End of chapter. Ooh. So wait, they've just killed Wendy. They've just shot her in the chest. <laughs> End of character. <laughs> <laughs> no, but see, our, our eagle-eyed listeners... is eagle-eyed isn't right, is it? Our, uh, our bat-eared listeners... <laughs> you can't say bat with corona around at the moment. Oh, yeah, sorry. What else is... <laughs> What else is good at listening? <laughs> uh, what are those fennec foxes in the desert that have got accepted? Our fennec foxed ears listeners <laughs> might have even picked up a clue earlier on in some other chapters as to what's going to happen now. Because I remember, I remember a clue that, that Barry was like, oh, oh this will be important oh, later. Oh, Wait, no, don't say it because I want people to guess. <laughs> this is why this lady's Pinterest is so important. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. David is looking so confused He's right like, now. It's what? great. <laughs> I, need to listen, I need to listen to this audio book podcast that I am a part of. <laughs> I, do, I do listen to them, but I just maybe don't retain things that are important. I'm just listening out for silly voices. I think that's it was, where... It was, li <laughs> it was literally just a one-liner. It was like, 
Uh, yeah, th- this will be a no, point I know later. What you're talking about. That was a long chapter. So we we got another yeah, but we got another cliffhanger. Yeah, Barry's finally uh, yeah. building up some tension and building up some drama here. So yeah. just looking again at lit charts for some stuff to do lit with this charts. chapter. <laughs> it got to be done, it every week. <laughs> and I think the, the main the main thing I want to look at. Well, there's two things that you want to look at. One is the boys' way of fighting against the wolves. <laughs> That's bizarre. Yeah, and the other one is Hook's amazing plan to kill boys with cake. Yeah, which doesn't seem to make any sense at all. No, but I mean, this is the description on lit charts as to what the plan is. So the story won't allow us to forget that Hook, like the rest of the island, is a child's invention. There is some very large adult evil missing from a pirate who plans to kill children with delicious cake. Uh, Hook's origin in children's imaginations is significant both with respect to his relative innocence and his capacity for horrific violence, which likewise is children's handiwork. Hook also reflects the children's anxieties about mothers. It is fair to them that Hook plans to kill them with cake because they believe their motherlessness to be their weakness. So it's like mum isn't here to protect me from myself from my uh, because mums want to stop you from eating too many things that are bad for you and hook's big plan is like uh the trunchbull and matilda is i'm just going to give you this big massive cake and you're not going to be able to help yourself and you're going to throw up yourself to death maybe that's what he's going to do so he he doesn't really know if it'll kill them he just wants to give them a sugar coma yeah, so it, there's no there's no things that there's any poison in it or anything. The kids basically, probably from their parents saying, you can't eat all that cake because you'll get sick and you'll die, which is some of the lies that parents tell kids to make them <laughs> do things they want them to do. So in the child's head, they've gone, yeah, well, if I'm left to my own devices and I eat too much cake, I could die. But that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because obviously, yes, Neverland is completely an invention of the children's mm. heads. And yet you've got... The pirate is based on what they've heard from Treasure Island in terms of Long John Silver and all the rest of it. So they've got a very good glimpse of what these evil men are like in terms of their look or their character, but can't quite come up with the way that they would actually act in real life. Like As you said, Hook would have just dropped gunpowder down there or would have just dropped down with guns and shot everybody. There's no way he'd go back to his lair, bake a lovely cake and then leave it out for them. (laughs) Also, like, that does make sense. But also, by the same length of breadth, they did describe the way in which he just swatted aside someone without changing his step. Like, they know that yeah. what he spoke about. Yeah, so they, they, clearly... killed Sky- they killed Skylight, the pirate, just, just to that's demonstrate it. how he kills someone. Yeah, so that's yeah. like... So they do have a concept of how someone could be just brutal. Yes, but that was a baddie killing another baddie. In right. a child's world, innocence and people who are good never die do you know what i mean like the goodies never die in these stories do they they always beat the baddie that is true so if a baddie dies it's just a baddie getting his comeuppance so the uh the thing with the wolves the island's wolves are also the children's inventions in the children's world confusing behavior is just as effective a weapon as a dagger a dagger is more innocent there and strangeness is more potent so that's basically why they looked upside down and ran at the wolves because in a child's head with a child's invention confusing behavior is as dangerous as an actual weapon all right in their make-believe world well i wish that were true yeah i mean it definitely makes it makes it more interesting in terms of where this story could go because you know a cake the the big cake plot and running at wolves upside down was not in the Disney movie. So I'm intrigued to see what other crazy childlike inventions Barry comes up with to move this storyline forward. I feel like there could be some very fantastic kind of imaginary weird things coming at us that we have no idea were part of the book. So it's like, yeah, yeah we've got this this terrifying imagination and then they do really childish things. I quite like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, it's this weird kind of, you know paradox between mortal danger and absurdity it's gonna end in a water fight <laughs> oh. probably it'd be like a bugsy malone paint thing like oh we'd like that and that would Love that would that. work for our accents 
So what's the title of the next chapter, Josh? Where are we going after this? Chapter six is called The Little House. Oh, okay. On the prairie. Don't really give much away. It could be Wendy's house because Wendy lived in a little house made of Uh, leaves in Neverland. A Wendy house. That's where that came from, right? Yeah, probably. That is actually where that came from. Mm. I think I I read that somewhere. She's going to have a house built for her, maybe, already? Well, she already has a house. Yeah, her house is made of leaves. She lived oh, in a house, yes. John lived in a boat, and Michael lived in a wigwam. So Yeah, I remember that now. So we're guessing that this is going to be them taking Wendy to her house to kind of nurse her back to health, maybe. But then the last chapter was a vague title, and we had no idea what it was going to be about, and he doesn't seem to stick. The shadow title had nothing to do with the shadow in, so who knows. If you have any comments or insights about this chapter, then you can email us on thelazybookclub at gmail.com. Or give us a little Tinkerbell on Twitter. Oh, God. at Lazy Book Club Pod. <laughs> or I can't think of anything inventive. Just come on to my Instagram <laughs> at Lazy Book Club Pod. To be fair, it'd be interesting to see how many episodes we go until he just starts giving up trying to be creative anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so next week, a little house. We'll see you there. <laughs> <laughs>